I'm just, we're thrilled that you're here and they know all about you. Uh, <laughs> I've done the work. Right. Okay. They, they actually have uh, the Eastman recording of Mountains, which I really like because- Oh, it's, they do? Yeah, okay. I, I love that because it's live. Um, right, right. And- uh, Well, we can certainly talk about that piece and uh, lots of other issues that uh, you and your students might be interested in. So I'm delighted yeah. to be here. So we kind of do this in three parts, what, what we've been doing with our, our visitors. The first thing we like to talk about is your life in music. And yeah. um, because of the whole COVID thing and the fact that this particular ensemble has a number of students who are graduating both at the undergraduate and graduate level right. um, and the world that they're kind of walking into, which is uncertain, <clears throat> it's been really good for, I think, for them to hear about the twists and turns of one's career. Right and how everything isn't like we drew it up. <laughs> and exactly, exactly. Well, uh, let me start out by saying that uh, I have an association with the state of Washington that goes back uh, 52 years. My first teaching position was at Pacific Lutheran University uh, in Tacoma, Washington, and my son uh, Christopher was born uh, in Tacoma. And uh, then later I had a uh, ballet that I wrote for the Pacific Northwest Ballet Company when Kent Stowell was the choreographer. You may maybe yes. know Kent. I do. Um, and then finally, uh, Jerry Schwartz is an old friend of, of over 40 years. So lots of, uh, lots, of, lots of connections with people in Washington State, for sure. And I remember, I remember Pacific Lutheran uh, campus as being in a really extraordinarily beautiful place. But I had so many performances in, out east in Boston and New York and uh, Philadelphia and, and uh, Washington that I really couldn't live in, in Tacoma, Washington. So after one year, I simply, I left the job uh, and uh, headed east at that point in time. It was really important that I be close to the performers that were involved with my music. Right. And uh, first of all, let me just give you uh, some uh, background about, um, if you if you like, uh, about about my how I started in music. And you know, I think for a lot of your students and, and maybe you and certainly me. Uh, it's not unusual for musicians to start very early in age. I mean, Chopin was only four years old, and we all know Mozart was four. Uh, cellos Yo-Yo Ma, I think, was five. And of course, the, the great American composer uh, Samuel Barber was seven. And there's this really touching letter, if I could read this letter uh, from, Barber, from Samuel Barber to his mother. Uh, and it goes like this. Uh, Dear mother, I've written this to tell you not to worry about my secret. Now don't cry when you read it because it's neither your, yours nor my fault. I suppose I will have to tell it now without any nonsense. To begin with, I was not meant to be an athlete. He's nine years old and he misspells the, the word athlete. I was meant to be a composer. Again, he's nine and will be, I'm sure. I will ask one more thing. Don't ask me to try to forget this unpleasant thing and go play football, please. <laughs> so uh, uh, at the age of 10, he wrote his first opera. So not uncommon for musicians uh, like myself and, and a lot of other musicians to start very young, as opposed to, uh, you know, I don't think you come out of the womb thinking you're going to be a brain surgeon. Right. But for music, it's, it, it's, quite, it's quite common. And I indeed started out uh, as... Uh, a young boy very much interested in music. And I had an older boyhood friend who um, played the guitar and showed me the instrument. And it, it was like a light bulb went on in my life. And I knew at that point in time that this was really what I wanted to do. And so I started taking lessons uh, early on. And I had this wonderful teacher. His name was Robert Stein. He was an extraordinary guy. And I had lessons in my home every Saturday Saturday morning at uh, 10 o'clock. I'll never ever forget that. And uh, as soon as we started working, there was something unusual about <laughs> the way I would work. He would give me these studies to, to work on and I would never play them the, the way that we were written. I would often add harmonies. I would add phrases here or there. I might embellish a particular line. And um, it just seemed to me that's the way the music was better made. And finally, he, had, he simply had enough of this. And he said to, he said to me, look, I really want you to, um, to work on these studies the way, the, the way that they are notated. Hmm. 
So the next week I came back and I hadn't worked on anything, but I wrote three pieces for the guitar. <laughs> so he knew that there was no way he could deal with this particular, uh, you know, young music student in a kind of normal way. So I said, look, if, if you play those studies note for note as they're on the page, you can bring in your pieces to me and I'll be glad to, to look at them. So I played these pieces for him. And from that point on, I knew that I was more interested in creating music than recreating music. Mm. And I'm, I'm young, but I know that that's really what excites me. The other thing that uh, was a part of this issue was I had a guitar that was given to me by my great uncle. And it was a very old guitar. It was called a Martin Dreadnought. And uh, here's a picture of, of a Martin Dreadnought. <laughs> it's a very large instrument. And I'm a young boy and I, I, you know, I try to embrace the instrument, but it's very large. And the thing about the instrument that was extraordinary, it had this very large sound. It was one of the kind of the gutsiest sounding instruments back in the 30s. And the instrument I had went back to 1936. So it was a very special, special instrument. And what I would do is when I would practice, I would always put my, I would lay my head on the sound body of the instrument. So I always practiced. And when you do that, you hear the kind of resonances and sonorities that you obviously never hear when you're, you know, several feet away or several inches away from the, from the sound hold of the instrument. And what that did is it opened up the world of the guitar to a kind of extraordinary degree, hearing all these sounds bounce back and forth that you would never, ever hear. And I think that stuck with me uh, even to this day when I think about music. I like music that has sharp and clear articulation, but yet is often in a kind of sonic and resonant, resonant kind of sound space. And I really think it comes from that experience of practicing, practicing endlessly on the guitar uh, with my head you know, cranked over on, on the sound body playing that way, number one. And number two, the ability of this extraordinary teacher to engage this young uh, musician uh, realizing what potential talents he might have had in terms of writing music and then allowing me to, to bring my piece pieces in. And so we did that and I learned a lot about harmony, musical form. And one day uh, I came in to a lesson and I said, you know, I really love uh, the Dvorak New World Symphony. It's, it's a really a wonderful piece. And my parents had this extraordinary record collection of 78 RPM records. Mm -hmm. I know most of your students have no idea what those are, yeah. but they're very large <laughs> and uh, they, uh, they have fairly short playing times, but it's what we had back in the, uh, in the early, late 40s and early 50s. And I used to listen uh, to the Dvorak all the time. So the next week he came back and he, it was, he was a really extraordinary man. He had written uh, an arrangement of some of the major themes of the Dvorak symphony for me to play. And I thought this was just the most wonderful thing he could ever do for me in my life. And I really revered him. And, and uh, when I think about him today, after so many years, uh, I, he's the reason that I'm a musician today because he gave me this kind of breathing space to explore those things that he felt and that I felt were important to me and how I could advance myself on the instrument, which I think was my first priority to become a better musician. And this allowed me to do that. Now, in order to do that, I had to go beyond the bounds of what was on the written page to begin to explore the, the possibilities of the music. But I had good ears even back then, and I already could kind of tell, I, I think I can improve this music if I do these things that I would add, you know, just by ear at that point in time. Well, I never look back, and uh, I'm 77 years old, and I have the same passion about music that I had as I remember when I was this young boy. And I think that's the case for many musicians, you know? It's not about a career move, it's how you lead, how you live your life, how you decide you wanna live your life. And for me, it's always been music and making the music as best I can with my friends. And I think when you have that opportunity, uh, life doesn't get much better than that. Right. So I started out that way uh, by, early on deciding that I really wanted to be a composer. And everything I did from that point on was always a part of that, uh, that aspect of looking at life that way. In, in the same sense that Samuel Barber understood very young that he wanted to be a composer as well, you know.
Works so it chose me. I didn't choose. I don't think I chose it. it. It's something that I knew that this is the way I wanted to live my life. Right. And this was in Chicago, right? Yeah, I was born in, uh, born in Chicago and um, studied with Mr. Stein. And I advanced very quickly on the instrument. And uh, then he, he, he was not, he, he taught all kinds of instruments, violin, piano, uh, woodwind instruments. And I got to a point where he didn't think he could teach me much more. And so then we started on the violin and I took some lessons with him on the violin and also piano. So we moved on to other instruments and again began to explore uh, other repertoire. And one of the things uh, that I had available that of course musicians today maybe don't understand with the enormous amount of music that's available 24 seven on YouTube and television and recordings was when I was young, the only thing available was uh, the radio, number one, and the recordings, these old 78 recordings. And it turns out my parents had a very extensive record collection of symphonies, of light opera, and of a very interesting group of recordings by the Belgian guitarist, Django Reinhardt. Oh, yeah. Now, Reinhardt was an extraordinary improviser and well known uh, in Europe, uh, certainly. And for some reason, my parents loved that music. And there was a whole series of recordings of uh, Reinhardt playing with the Hot Club of France, his ensemble uh, in Paris. And uh, he was just extraordinary. And I thought to myself, if I ever get to be good, I would hope to be able to play like that. So the idea of improvisation came into the picture as well as a young, uh, young musician. So I was interested in composing. I was inter interested in, in improvising because I heard this really wonderful uh, guitarist, who by the way, uh, was deformed in a fire. He could only play with, uh, in his right hand, with his left hand with two fingers. And yet he, was, he could play just in an extraordinarily advanced way. And so I had that uh, as, um, as a resource. I had that. And then r the radio was also an important resource. And my father helped me build a crystal radio when I was young. And it was an extraordinary little device, and I could hear all the major stations uh, in Chicago. And there was a series of radio stations. I used to stay up all night long listening, and they were a series of, um, of, 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 of radio stations that involved uh, black musicians in South Chicago in some of the black clubs. Mm -hmm. And there were musicians like uh, Muddy Waters and Holland Wolf and Blind Lemon Jefferson. And these were uh, uh, blues musicians from the South that moved up to Kansas City and to Chicago and into Detroit in order to make a living. And uh, these clubs were very popular on the South side of Chicago and they actually broadcast their concerts. And I was, they used to stay up all night listening to this extraordinary music. Now here I am a kind of a white kid from the suburbs listening to this unbelievable music that I, had, I couldn't have possibly have gone to hear, and it increased the you know my ideas about what was possible in music uh, just infinitely at that point in time. So it was through recordings, it was through the radio that gave me opportunities to hear music that I otherwise would not know anything about. You know, right, right. And so, I understood that early on. I understood that early on, even though I didn't know exactly <laughs> how how it might uh, impact my work later. Right, so you're developing this incredible sort of aural encyclopedia. And then as a kid, you're in your school band playing tuba. I know this about you. Well, that's, <laughs> that was another thing that got me into trouble because I would never, I, I played this, a small E flat tuba and I would never play with the, with the, with the tuba players. I used to play the trombone parts. Awesome. Because you could play very high, right? And the, the trauma parts were always much more interesting than the tuba parts. Right. And uh, the, the band director would constantly admonish me for, you know, please play what the other players are, are supposed to play. And no, I didn't want to do that. And I also would add things to it as well. So even in high school, they, I was difficult to deal with uh, yeah. when it came yeah. to playing what was on the, what was on the printed page. Yeah, I, we, we sort of have a similar background that way. I, I grew up about an hour from Chicago and Oh, you did? Where? Uh, down near Kankakee. I actually grew up on a farm, um, but you could get to the loop in an hour. Oh, I know all about Kankakee. I had relatives who were farmers in Mantino, you know, the town of That's Mantino. my high school. Oh, That's you're kidding. Are you no. serious? No. 
such there a was, small world. <laughs> there was, for my students, this high school, there were 73 students in my graduating class. So the fact that he knows about a town of two and a half thousand people, that's crazy. How well, my uncle, my uncle who gave me the guitar, Pete, he lived in Mantino. No kidding. And he would play, he would play, you know, for country dances and all of that. And uh, when, when, when he gave me the instrument, I was just so happy about it. Unfortunately, I gave it away. Uh, this particular instrument, this particular instrument was sold, uh, it was a 1941 uh, Martin Dreadnought sold for $75,000. What? <laughs> and I had an even earlier one from 1936 and I gave it away, so. Uh. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. <laughs> so you stayed in Chicago, you went to the American, right, the American? Yeah, I went to the American Conservatory for three years and graduated in three years, and then went to Northwestern and did my graduate work there. Right, right, right. And then out here with us folk for, for a time. Uh, yeah, and one of the things uh, about uh, my experience uh, in college, it was um, during the Vietnam War, and um, I remember I had won three awards from, the, um, from BMI, the Broadcast Music Incorporated, and my music got in the hands of Arthur Weisberg, um, who has since passed away. But Arthur Weisberg was the bassoonist in the New York Woodwind Quintet. Hmm. He was a leading freelance musician in New York City. And he had a group called the Contemporary Chamber Ensemble. And it became, at that time, in the mid, early and then mid 60s and early 70s, the leading new music group uh, in the country. Mm -hmm. And new music ensembles were just beginning mm -hmm. to be developed. Mm -hmm. And they largely were professional groups of independent uh, professional musicians in the major cities like New York and in Boston who were really interested in new music and had uh, integrated their work with a lot of the young composers at the time. And I was, so while I was a graduate student, I got connected with Arthur Weisberg in the Contemporary Chamber Ensemble. And that really changed my life. So I was a student and still, but getting my music played by probably the best new music players on the planet at that time. Mm -hmm. And I learned so much about how music is made from working with those musicians. I mean, I had very good, you know, colleagues at the university, but uh, these guys, these were guys that could sight read unbelievably difficult music. And it was a kind of badge of, of honor to play the most difficult music that was being written at the time. Right. And so that early influence while I was a student was uh, really important um, for my professional, ongoing professional career then. Right. And initially, um, you were composing a lot of pieces for smaller groups. Yeah, there were groups like the Contemporary Chamber Ensemble, the Boston Music of Eva in Boston, the 20th Century Consort in, in Washington, D.C., and groups like that. Uh, and this was before universities had their own new music programs, which, you know, most, most schools have nowadays. Right. And then you, you sort of pivoted towards the, the bigger ensemble works, uh, certainly orchestrally initially, right? But, right. And uh, I'll tell you how this, uh, well, the first thing that happened was I was commissioned by the American Composers Orchestra, which was the leading new music orchestra in New York City. And uh, I wrote a piece called Aftertones of Infinity. And Lucas right. Foss was the conduct, had conducted that piece. Um, and what happened after that was, um, I got a call from my publisher saying that there is a conductor in St. Louis who is looking at your And the Mountains Rising Nowhere. This is 1977, right? Uh, when I wrote that piece. And he's very interested in doing the work. And it was Leonard Slatkin with the St. Louis Symphony. Right. I thought to myself, Leonard Slatkin is interested in doing a wind ensemble work with the St. Louis Symphony. That works. <laughs> uh, that's curious, isn't it? That's very <laughs> curious. So um, he looked at it and he got back to the publisher and said, look, I'm very interested, uh, I'm, I'm interested in that work, but there's no way we can perform this because it involves all, these all this doubling. And when, as you know, when orchestra musicians double, they get paid extra compensation. Exactly. And at that time, back in the early 80s, that extra compensation, I think, was going to be something like eight or ten thousand yeah. dollars. So he was not willing to, you know, be charged that f um, for a eleven-minute uh, or wind ensemble piece. <laughs> right. But then he, he went back to the publisher and said, "Look, uh, to my publisher, are there are there any other works of this 
a young composer that I can look at. And they, they had uh, then, After Tones of Infinity was sent to him. Hmm. He then looked at it and uh, programmed it with every guest orchestra the, the next year. And that started my relationship with him and with orchestral music. Right. So my, my whole life, the last 40, 50 years of writing orchestral music comes from a wind ensemble piece that I wrote in 1977. That silly little thing. Well, I want to talk about that um, <laughs> because it's, it's so iconic. It's a piece that I love dearly. I don't think there's a person in my profession that wouldn't say that it's one of the 10 most influential pieces in our idiom. Well, a couple, let me tell you a couple of things about how that, that developed. I was on the faculty at the Eastman School and, of course, was listening to the Eastman Wind Ensemble when Donald Hunsberger was the music director. And he asked me, asked me for a piece. And uh, many of the students that I had in my classes were also in the Wind Ensemble. And I obviously admired the ensemble and how well it, it played. But I really had little interest in writing wind ensemble music at the time because I remember the kind of repertoire that I had when I was in high school in the high school band right pretty wretched <laughs> and it was uh, it was dreadful it right. was it was either this terrible music written for the uns for bands or it was transcriptions of uh, 19th century symphonies you know, right, right. That, that didn't make any sense to me even then but I did have one experience in high school that was really important I became a jazz musician uh, and I was in the jazz ensemble and uh, you know almost 60 years ago we had jazz ensembles in high school and I had this extraordinary I went to this extraordinary high school called Thornton Township High School that had an orchestra had had uh, several bands you had to take lessons to be in the band even back then yep and I was in the jazz ensemble and the thing the interesting thing about the jazz ensemble was the leader of, of the director of the ensemble was a, a studio arranger for the WGN radio orchestra now I don't know how many of your students know that back in the 30s and 40s and even into the 50s large radio stations had orchestras. The famous one is Toscanini with the, with the New York uh, uh, Radio Orchestra, uh, NBC Orchestra in New York. And in any case, this man was the lead arranger for the WGN, which was a large radio station, 100,000 watt station in Chicago. And he came and, came and rehearsed our ensemble. And we only, paid, we only played professional charts. We never had any educational, I'm not sure there was much educational music for jazz ensemble at that time anyway, but we played only professional charts. And so the, the performance level was very high. And in fact, some of the musicians that I went to high school with ended up in the Count Basie band later. They continued wow. on in music. So that high school experience was really, really important as well, especially that of working with professional musicians. So when I look back on it now, I wrote my first 12 tone piece for jazz ensemble when I was in high school. <laughs> and for some reason, my high school had scores of, uh, of Anton Webern. Now I can't explain to you how in the world that happened, but I was able to look at this music and study it even in high school. I mean, it was just wow. extraordinary experience. And so, uh, you know, I look back at my, my student days taking lessons on the guitar and my work in high school is being really seminally important to my life as a professional musician. Right. So Don Hunsberger comes to you. Yeah. And he said, look, well, you know, we'd like you to write a piece. And I said, well, OK. And, uh, and I had a lot of the students in my class, so I agreed to do it. But again, I, I was thinking about, oh, my God, all the terrible repertoire. The, even then, the, the, uh, even the Eastman Wind Ensemble was playing transcriptions. And I thought, right. this, is, this is crazy. And so my head at that time was dealing with professional musicians with new music ensembles. And I wasn't writing orchestra music at the time. And I hadn't written an orchestra uh, wind ensemble piece before. And so I'm thinking, what can I do so this piece doesn't sound like your kind of typical band piece, you know, with all those clarinets. So as you know, the piece has very few clarinets, right? It was it, right. two clarinets or something. Yeah, mission accomplished. <laughs> and uh, lots of percussion. Right. And I was also very much interested in Varese. When I was a student, I had the opportunity uh, to meet Varese. And I remember as a student in Chicago at Northwestern University, I used to hang out at the University of Chicago most of the time because they had a contemporary chamber ensemble at the university. 
And Ralph Shapey, the conductor, composer, and the conductor of the ensemble would bring in musicians from all over the world. They had funding to bring in you know, renowned uh, artists, including Varese. Mm. And I'll never fit, forget the experience of going to one of the concerts at Mandel Hall at the university when Varese, <clears throat> after a series of performances of his music, um, they asked him to come on stage and very, he was an elderly man. Slowly he came out on stage and I remember him turning to the audience. And of course we were clapping and we were clapping and we were clapping and we were clapping and he just stood there and it, the clapping went on for about 15 minutes. It was unbelievable. Wow. Finally, someone had to come and help him off the stage. And so obviously, you could look at it two, two ways. Either he wasn't all quite, quite all there, or he was taking in, taking in the audience's appreciation for all the years of neglect that he suffered by being not performed in this country at all. Right, had for many, many years. Right. I never forgot that experience at all. It was really quite meaningful to me. Right. Um, so that uh, that was important. But in any case, to get back to And the Mountains, I knew I didn't want to write that kind of typical sounding uh, piece. But to connect with Varez, I was very much influenced by Varez at that time. And if you know any of Varez's music, you know how much, how important percussion was. Mm -hmm. And for me as well. And I think it's because of the experience of the guitar and how it articulates and how I was thinking about space how you fill vaulted spaces <laughs> with sound, you know? That's never left me ever. Right. And I think that gives my music whatever characteristics it has. It's because of that experience. That really go, by, go right to the DNA of who I am as a musician, you know? And, it's, right. and it has to go back to the, those early days as a student. Right. I'm always interested in knowing what kind of instrument a, good, a composer, one of my students plays, because it tells you an awful lot about where they're coming from in terms of their own music. Right, well, the ringing guitar strings have always made a lot of sense to me ever since I heard you say that many years ago. So I want to do something weird with you. Um, yeah. One of my favorite things to do with mountains is to make sure I program it in the fall when I know I have a really good freshman class coming in. <laughs> because I, it's the best piece you ever could put in front of uh, students of that age to say, yep, yeah, this isn't high school. Um, <laughs> So you know what I'd like to do? I have a whole yeah. bunch of uh, questions about it. You know, I've conducted many times all of your pieces, which first of all, I want to make sure I get this in. I'm so glad you're still doing it. We played the Awakening Hour recently and we did Luminosity and- Oh, really? Yeah, really? and, um, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for you, watch this. <laughs> okay. I lost you. Okay, see ya, I see it. So, um, yeah. The first thing I wanted to talk to you about is uh, uh, one of the quotes that we have in the book from uh, so long ago, 18 years ago now, is you talk about inspiration from poetry. Yeah. Um, the actual quote that I've never forgotten is you say you're inspired by images of poetry. Right. Um, and so if you talk a little bit about what you see here, how it relates to form, how it influenced you, that'd be great. Maybe tell the backstory of the poem. Yeah, now Carol Adler at the time was the wife of the composer Samuel Adler. She was a friend of mine, uh, and uh, Sam and I were colleagues at, at Eastman at the time. And uh, I especially love this particular, particular poem. It's very succinct, it's very short, it's almost like haiku in many ways. And it, it says a lot with very few words. Um, and the line that obviously the, the title of the piece is drawn from, and the mountains rising nowhere, struck me as, as uh, really kind of an extraordinary image. If you, think, if you think about what that might mean, you can see mountains rising into the mist because they're so high and they have such, mountains have such power if you think about it. Uh, and then the sound returns and there's sound there, the bells, uh, and then the colors. I was also, I was also, um, it seems I was influenced when I think about my music, I think in colors as well. Uh, and so the sepia color came, came through strongly. Mm -hmm. Obviously bells and, and the mountains is full of bell sounds. And then the so those sounds return and that obviously happens in the piece as well. So it's not a literal 
uh, translation of the poem into music, but certain images that seem to evoke from the poetic uh, lines that uh, were important. And then chimes, obviously, uh, again, you can refer to all those uh, mallet, uh, metallophones that you find in mountains. So the idea, two ideas, one idea was that I certainly didn't want to use the kind of standard instrumentation that one would normally find in a band or even in a wind ensemble. I wasn't even, even sure what the wind ensemble instrumentation was. I don't think I ever calculated that, although I mean, I knew generally what it was. But I knew I didn't want to have that sound, so I avoided the kind of prototypical mass group of clarinetists, you know, who in the past would simply translate orchestral string sounds, right, in 19th century transcriptions of symphonies. Um, so that was important to me to have that aspect of the piece be very different than the, what was being written at the time. The other was, of course, um, the idea of um, the idea of, of using such a large group of percussion. I wasn't aware of any pieces that did that, although there were probably many, I don't know. But uh, this seemed to be one of the first pieces that really goes into big time use of percussion in the, uh, in the wind ensemble. Now, the thing about the, about the performance was uh, when we first started to rehearse it, it was just unplayable. I mean, it just couldn't be played. <laughs> it wasn't, I mean, the Eastman kids are very good and they were very good even back then. And they could play almost everything you put in front of them, but it was unplayable. And it took a long time for them to finally work it all out. Nowadays, people seem to play it, I don't know, very easily. They, uh, you know, musicians have gotten much better over the last, what, 50 years, 45 years, whatever it is. Um, but at the time, it was really very, very tough. So, but I was working with professional musicians at the time, and I guess I just felt, well, you know, this is what I want to do, and so I'll go ahead and do it. I don't hear you. I, you're muted. I don't hear you, Tim. Sorry, I'm here. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So, excuse me. Um, so, yeah, well, I just say as an aside, first of all, I think it's the piece that introduces sort of percussion and winds in equal partnership. And in, in that respect, among others, that's one of the game changers about this piece. Um, I remember a performance we did and the soon professor at the time was huffy with me backstage saying, how can you let the percussion do that? And I said, well, it says brutale. I, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, um, so the instrumentation yeah. we have here, uh, a lot of double reed players. And I wanted to point out yeah. to the students a very, very important component part that I'm sure he's going to uh, talk about, which are these glass crystals that yeah. the oboe players in English horn are charged with uh, sounding from time to time. Talk to us about the inspiration for that uh, sort of Octave. Yeah, well, <clears throat> a lot of my early chamber music involved uh, employing the players um, playing a number of different instruments. If you're a clarinetist, you don't necessarily just play your clarinet. You might play some ancillary percussion instruments, for example. Yeah. And uh, so a lot of the new, new music ensembles, these players were adept at, you know, playing all kinds of multiple instruments uh, with new music pieces. And I had a number of chamber pieces that uh, involved this um, multiple instrumentation. So I decided to, to use the crystals, which I had done in a number of, of chamber pieces. I first heard the glass harmonica uh, in the Boston, at the Boston Library. They have a, a, a music instrument division. And there is a uh, glass harmonica um, that uh, they have uh, in, in that museum that was actually designed by Ben Franklin. And, wow. and actually the glass harmonica was a very popular salon instrument in Mozart's time. And Mozart has some pieces for glass harmonica and, and strings, for example, mm -hmm. really quite lovely. And the way the, inst the, the real instrument works is a series of glass bowls, one inside another on a, on a, on a, a kind of spindle affair. And then part of those crystals then are allowed to, uh, are bathed in, in water and by lightly touching the edges of the crystals, you can get a, a single or in some cases, multiple sounds. So I was really fascinated with this, the quality of that sound. If you close your eyes, 
you can't tell where that sound is coming from. Right. It has this kind of ambient sonority that is difficult to determine the direction of the sound. And that, that appealed to me as well. Filling up a hall with this kind of sound that is not definable in terms of directionality. Right. So that was one of the uh, ideas that I carried over from, from uh, new music groups. So this piece is really more informed, I think, probably by uh, a lot of the music that I was listening to at the time, uh, Varese and uh, uh, especially Varese, I would say, and uh, as well as the idea of uh, this multiplicity of instrumentation. Right. So to get to the music, the first yeah. thing that we notice, of course, is the open scoring and uh, this beautiful quote that uh, we had in the chapter. You said George Crumb once said to you, music that looks beautiful often sounds beautiful. So yeah. that, was, that was your motivation here? Well, no. Uh, the motivation was to make the score. I, a lot of my scores look this way from this time. Mm -hmm. This is pre-computer, right? So right. Um, what I was working on were large sheets of French vellum. I used to import it from France. <laughs> and uh, I had designed a pen to draw five lines. And I thought that the music was most clear if if the staves were not didn't get in the way and there were just a lot of empty staves that you would often see in scores for no apparent reason so i only had a staff when something was going on and when there was no music there was no the, the page was blank and so i the, the the calligraphic part of this was also something that was important to me and i remember my father always I don't think he wanted me to be a musician. He wanted me to be an architect because as a kid, I used to draw a lot. You know, it's interesting thing about creative kids. They will find a way to let their creativity come out. <laughs> Even if their parents don't want it to come out, it will come out. And I remember when I was in kindergarten, I won an award for poetry, if you can believe that. I used to draw constantly. And then I would compose and, and I would write the music down. So, you know, your creativity will find a way out uh, wherever, it, wherever it, it, it lies. And I think for me, uh, certainly the influence of Crumb is pretty strong. And when I went to him, uh, we, I spent a whole day with George Crumb, who was a good friend, uh, a whole day with him talking about notation. And that quote obviously uh, refers, if you look at his music, it is very beautiful yeah. just to look at, even if you don't look at the notes or the musical ideas that uh, are embraced by the way the scores look. So it was important for me to score, for me to have the score look a certain way. And at the time, there were no other kind of wind ensemble pieces that seemed to be notated this way. There's another important part of this, and that some of the music is in a spatial um, kind of time, time frame. And the reason for doing that was I didn't want a sense of pulse. So all the music that kind of hangs in the air, all the music where performers and conductors can interpret how fast you go from one section to another is written in that spatial notation. When it gets to music where you have to coordinate players in a very specific way, i.e. there are spots that are metrically defined, then you have to use kind of traditional notation. So this piece, one of the things about the piece is it moves back and forth, as you know, between those two worlds, okay? Now I could have, I suppose I could have written the spatial music metrically, but that would imply pacing, that would imply a, a kind of specificity that I didn't want. Right. So another part of this piece is the idea of, of relaxing the issues of exactly when you come in. And that's determined by the conductor to some ex to large extent, obviously, when you throw your cues to have people come in. And then often gestures where you can't exactly coordinate them from one performance to the next. So you get, you get spots where percussionists are asked to take off and play very fast notes. They're never played the same way twice each time. And they're not meant to be, right? But what you get in that is you get a kind of energy that you wouldn't if people were counting and trying to fit all notes within a pulse, right? So you get a kind of energy and a kind of almost improvisatory, improvisatory quality about the music that you wouldn't get if it were written in a more traditional way. Right. So it wasn't just by accident that it, I had that in mind early on when I was writing the piece.
right. but there'd be these two different worlds that you would move back that you, the, the students or the musicians and the conductor would move back and forth between right and you probably experience that yourself in your own performances and when you move to the next another section it depends on a lot it depends on the students it depends on the hall what right. the hall sounds like right right and uh so you're you're making these decisions on the basis of the the real live situation of the music and the musicians at hand right as we go forward here does that make sense i mean is that perfect sense yeah perfect sense and that may not have been done with earlier wind ensemble pieces. I mean, I don't know, but uh, you know, maybe this is one of the earlier times when this kind of thinking was part of the wind ensemble repertoire. Well, for large wind ensembles, no. I think this was groundbreaking in that sense. But um, before we go forward, I just want to yeah. say such a, it, the score is such a beautiful piece of visual art. And this is my study score which I've drawn all over. It's kind of like defacing the painting of the Mona Lisa. So I, I really apologize. That's okay. Um, but let me ask you something. Let me ask something about what were you, what are the drawings? What, I mean, you've got some arrows here and there. Is that just about when to sync people up? Is that yes. basically what it is? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just, um, I, I've used this. I travel um, to Asia quite a bit and I'm attempting to try to get the Chinese to look at some more forward thinking music uh, and yeah. constructs. And I've, done a couple of lectures and that's why I happened to have this in my computer. Um, it was on overheads in oh, yeah. and okay. stuff. All right, so we go for- Let me ask you one more question since uh, you've made this, you've performed this a lot over the years. Um, how much flexibility do you find in those, in those spatial areas to, to kind of pull and stretch the music? Or yeah. do you, have you, have you have in your mind's eye, do you have a way that it's supposed to be done and you just kind of follow through? No, no. I think no. that the ambience of the hall is everything. I think everything, how, much, yeah. how much resonance, just like you putting your head on your guitar. I mean, that's, yeah. that's kind of what we do in those moments. I think we listen for that resonance and see how long it rings and how much sense it makes and if it needs to touch what's to follow and et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, to some extent you do that even with metrical music. And you, Absolutely. And more, yeah, yeah. So... Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we have um, a combination of things here for the students that are watching that I was yeah. hoping you would talk about. One is, your, let's back up just a little bit, your choice of, of meter and why you chose to do this throughout in the meter sections. Yeah. Okay. Well, a lot of, a lot of my music was written where the, um, the bottom denominator was a note head rather mm -hmm. than uh, eight or 16. And that was just a kind of convention that was beginning to be used by lots of, lots of composers at the time. One of the things about new music, if you look over the history of new music in the 20th century, what you see is that there are, that the, the note values are becoming smaller and smaller. Right. And the best example of that, I guess, is George Crumb's music, who take, really does take it to extreme. You will find a 32nd note equal to 60 sometimes in his music. Now, where is that coming from? I mean, what, what motivates him to do that? <laughs> well, you know, every other musician might say, well, a quarter note equals 60, that's just perfectly fine. Right. But uh, for Crumb, this diminution of note values seemed to be important. And it seemed to be important to me. And one of the reasons is that if you use smaller note values, oftentimes then you get into, you get into uh, groups of notes that are beamed and beams help you clarify pulse. Okay. Right. Right. Now, uh, one composer who goes the other extreme in the 20th century is a composer that I've always admired, the Italian uh, serial composer, Luigi Dalla Piccolo. Right. He'll very often have a half note equal, oh, it could equal 120. Mm. Or he'll have a whole note as a pulse equal 64. And so you, it's not uncommon to find 4-2 and 6-2 and 7-2 or 5-1 <laughs> bars, in, whoops, bars in his music. Um, but certainly for many composers, um, the, the smaller note values, at least back in the 60s, seem to be something that uh, was currently a part of our thinking about how music should be rhythmically organized. Well, I always appreciated it just because of heightened concentration and what you can sort of teach through that. It's kind of like you're trying to make music in a different culture, sort of. Yeah. And, uh, kind yeah. of what, how it wires your brain. 
So there are a number of important pauses, but I wanted to just get to the singing and the whistling and uh, yeah. why you chose to employ that for color and whatnot. Well, again, I had written some chamber music that, that involves uh, asking, you know, a clarinetist to sing and whistle. And so it seemed to be appropriate to extend that idea to this larger ensemble. And this is the first piece. First of all, this is the first piece for wind ensemble that I had ever written. Right. And really the first kind of larger ensemble piece. I, I actually have a, 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 an earlier piece um, called Modus Celestis for um, 12 flutes, 12 strings, piano, and three percussion, uh, written in 1972. And uh, it utilizes this notation as well. But it goes even further. It allows the conductor to make big choices about how long sections are to last and when to move on to another section, depending on the conductor's uh, you know, musicality and, and how he feels the music should go. And so there's an element of improvisation on the conductor's part. And I still, I was thinking that there was some of that in this piece as well, to give some flexibility to the conductor to allow, allow for all the reasons we talked about to make these kinds of changes from one performance to the next. Right. But the music doesn't get kind of set in stone. And, they, and I've, you know, I've talked with conductors about this over the years, um, and they get in their mind of how the Beethoven Fifth ought to go, <laughs> you know, right. and they pretty much do it the same way uh, once they get it in their head that this is the way the music should, should unfold. And here's an environment that at least allows for the possibility of uh, manipulation, of change, of spontaneity, of a certain improvisational nature. And by the way, it seems to me that comes out in the way the music is played then. You know. Right. Right. You, you described uh, in the article, you described your music as sort of neo-baroque. Um, is that because of ornamentation issues? Would you yeah, I think so. I think it's a very baroque piece when I think about it. I mean, there's all this, the ornamentation of the percussion that have all these kind of fantastical gestures that, the, that, that they play. They can simply play two or three notes, but they don't. They have like more notes that they can possibly play within a short amount of time than right. you can imagine. Uh, and so they really have to there's a kind of energy in that, that no matter what, uh, you know, if there's blood on the floor most of the time, uh, because the piece just, the, those parts demand a, a kind of uh, engagement that you can't sit back and just let it kind of happen. You got to really go for it. And I really love, look, that's the kind of thing that I was getting when I was working with these professional new music players. Right. They would never let anything get by them, number one. And they'd call you out if you've written something that couldn't be played. Right. I remember the, the percussionist in the Contemporary Chamber Ensemble just laid into me one time in a piece that I had written for them. And in front of the rest of the members of the ensemble, and I'm a young, you know, I'm just barely out of graduate school. And he just laced into me and gave me all the reasons why this was impossible to play. And it, it didn't care whether <laughs> the rest of the musicians are, knew it or not. And I, you know, I learned a lot from that. I, I mean, I really did learn a lot about, okay, I guess I went too far. And I need to think about this the next time I write a passage that I thought was perfectly reasonable. He said, no, it's not only is it unreasonable, it's impossible, okay? Uh, and so you see, this is the great thing about the collaborative art that we have. We learn so much from our fellow musicians. Right. I remember talking when I was composer of residence with the St. Louis Symphony, the principal flutist. And um, he said to me, you know what? He says, who I am and what I do is inextri inextricably linked to the people that are around me. That's right. I've been playing with these mission musicians for over 30 years. It's hard to imagine my playing without them next to me, okay? Right. I mean, we're joined at the hip, okay? Right. Um, and that really stuck with me. And when you think about it, it's, it's really an important part of what we do in our art that sure, you can write all the piano solos you want in your life, but when you begin to get more than two people together, then the whole issue of how we collaborate and how we make better music becomes very significant mm -hmm. and how we can learn from each other. You, know, you get on a note, how you start the note, what happens when the note sustains, how do you get off of that note? Is it, is it sharply articulated at the end or do you smoothly let it die away? I mean, you know, you can go on for hours and discuss a single note and how it should be interpreted in a piece of music. Right, right. 
So I wanted to show the students um, a couple of things about the writing and I wanna be really, really cognizant of your time um, because you've been so gracious here. No, and no I problem, wanna, no problem. And I wanna allow a little time for them to ask questions, of course. But I wanted to talk about uh, what we would refer to, I think, you tell me if I'm wrong, sort of these static pillars. Yeah. Sort of, sort of based on what we, what you called shared monody, the notion of, right. of, yeah. Is this a good enough example or should I go to the end? What's, what's best? Should I go to the uh, end? The, the passage right at the end where all the flutes play that single line. Yeah, that's a great spot. Uh, here we go. We are getting there. Or even the brass playing toward the end. Uh, that's also shared monody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the single line at the end, at the end of the piece, there are these flutes play. There's a single line, and it's shared by uh, all the other players, each partaking in some of the notes, and so it's like a flute with a damper pedal, right? Uh, you know, and that was kind of the idea. You have this clear articulation of the, of the one player, and then these notes of that line are allowed to sustain. And it gives it uh, this quality of as though you had the damper pedal down on the piano. And a, a lot of my music has employs that technique of what I call shared monody. And I think it comes from this idea when I was a kid listening to the practicing the guitar with my ear on the soundboard where all these sounds, it, the, the sounds didn't stop, you know, they, they just died away someplace, but they kept on going until you couldn't hear them any longer. And, and so I think that idea of where you have a clear, I, a, a clear line, a single line, but then it's bifurcated into this collection of other instruments that give it, give it these notes additional life after they're articulated. And that was what was really interesting to me. The note has a life after its first articulation. And that's what this is all about. Right, right. It's the, the ringing of the guitar strings is stuck that, with that's it. That's right. Yeah. For a very, yeah. very long time. That's exactly right. There's no question about it. Um, so over time, as you've composed for the wind ensemble, you went away from the open scoring. I'm assuming, I'm just making a giant assumption. That's just a time thing. That's just a practical right. consideration. Because right. Um, I was so busy with commissions for orchestra music and chamber music and, uh, and wind ensemble music that um, I simply couldn't do this. This, this took an extraordinary amount of time to, to, to do this. And I really went to, uh, to more kind of traditional notation. And this again is pre-computer days, you know. Right. Um, it was a matter of expediency actually, you know. Right. But you know what, I felt it was hard to leave. <laughs> it was hard to leave because uh, I really love to do this. Uh, and uh, so it was hard to leave that. You know, the most beautiful scores that, that we have are your scores, I think, just in terms of visual art. There's so, another score written at this near this time, uh, spare, a piece called Sparrows for soprano and chamber ensemble that also utilizes this notation. Yeah, one of my... Uh, it moves back and forth between, you know, metric music and spatial music. Yeah, we did that two years ago. One of my docs oh, really? conducted it. Yeah, it's a great, what a wonderful piece. So there were, I'm not going to go too much farther here because the students need to chime in, but... Yeah three pieces in this trilogy of wind ensemble pieces right. uh, that didn't culminate until about what, 91 or so? I mean, right. uh, about three. And then you've continued, as I mentioned earlier on, you've continued to write for the wind ensemble for which we're all deeply grateful. Here's a question. How do you view um, from Mountains Rising Nowhere here all the way through to like luminosity, what's changed in your, in your opinion? How is it flushing itself out on the page? What you do mean you mean in my music? In my music? Yeah what, yeah, what do you think? Is is it evolved in any way, and is it tangible or no? Um, well, you know, as I get older, my music is simpler. I think, mm. and uh, <laughs> maybe it's the onset of senility. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> no, I'm trying. You know what? Look, I like I said, I left academia at the age of fifty nine because I wanted to lead an artist's life unencumbered with faculty obligations. Sure. And uh, which I've been able to do since that time, almost 20 years ago. And uh, I, it gave me an opportunity to think about what was important in, in my music. And what I wanted to say is I wanted to write an expressive music that was as direct as possible, that, that was intelligible to the musicians. Because if it's not intelligent musicians, forget about it. It's not right. gonna happen, right? right? So a certain clarity, of design and structure 
and content that um, is not simple minded, but a, a kind of directness of expression that comes across. What I learned was when I was composer in residence for the St. Louis Symphony was you had an audience that was completely unsophisticated when it certainly when it came to new music had no idea of what was going on, you know. And I knew that when, with in that environment, my music was going to get one hearing by an audience, probably. Right. And you were, I was hoping that would make some sense to them mm. through the first hearing. But I could never, you can never prove that. You could never know that. And it doesn't mean you write down to them, but you write in such a way that then it has a kind of intelligibility and an understanding to the musicians. Here's something that uh, I'll just relate to you. I was in rehearsal with Leonard, with Leonard Slatkin, um, I guess my third year as composer of residence in St. Louis. And I was in the hall while I was rehearsing a new piece. I'm the only one in the hall and the hall is darkened and they're, they're rehearsing. He stops the orchestra all of a sudden and he turns to me and he said, you know what? This music is like the standard repertoire for us at this point. Uh -huh. And at that time, they had played all of my orchestral music that I had written up to that point, several pieces for the orchestra. He let the orchestra go 20 minutes early. Uh -huh. And I thought to myself, that's where I want to be, where the musicians know that music. And that orchestra knew my music better than any other contemporary composer because they were playing it all the time in St. Louis. Right. And I thought to myself, that's the kind of music I want to write that can be engaged by the musicians and understood by them, right? And not to take any shortcuts compositionally or musically or to dumb down the music, but to be as honest as I can and to be as direct as, and expressive as I can in, in my work. Mm -hmm. And what that's led to is a music that I think is more intelligible than certainly my early music, which was, was <laughs> not intelligible at all, only for an initiated few, you know? Right, so more direct expression, I think that's- yeah, yeah. I see that. I hear. I mean, I hear that in your in your music. Um, so, just one one more question, then we'll yeah. turn over to the students. Um, so, this you read the article about what it is we've embarked on here, right. and um, I think it's been really good for them, and they're coming up with extraordinary things. If you go to that article, you can hear some of it at the links at the end. Um, so, some of them are just starting with this notion of improvisation and composition, and um, can okay. you give them just? a couple of things to think about, just uh, how, the process, you know, how to not slam your head against the wall till you bleed to death, you know, <laughs> whatever works. Well, I mean, look, they're gonna go out in the world where the kind of educational system that some students have is not what I had when I was young. Right. I think the educational system, you know, for young people is, well, certainly in the, in the university, it's fantastic, but at, you know, grade school level, it can be just terrible. Right. It's gone down dramatically, it seems to me. That's my, my sense of it. Right. Except in certain certain places, obviously, where there's uh, enough resources to have students take lessons and, and uh, you know, really fine, uh, fine programs. But um, it's difficult for the young teachers to go out there these days and try to, to, advance, to advance our art. And the materials that I see even today, the educational materials, uh, leave much to, to be desired from my point of view. Right. And I would encourage uh, young music directors, whether they're in grade school or in high school, to take chances, to try things that they think will go beyond the bounds of what is normally available and give the, the students an opportunity to see just how interesting music can be. If right. that means improvising or just starting a project where you ask some student to play something, <laughs> ask maybe the best clarinetist in the band to play a lick and then ask someone else to respond to that. And, and then pretty soon you've got an ensemble of four or five instruments playing. And then you ask, you throw a cue to someone else to come in and to see what that's like. And then to stop and say, well, what did you think about all of that? And what was important to you? And why did you do this? And why did you do that? Now, that's different than saying, okay, kids, we're going to play these three pieces in our one hour rehearsal today, you know? So I think if you do some of that, not only that, but if some of that it expands the kids' minds about what's possible in music and how they might interact in a way that's not so obvious by simply playing what's on the page. Right. 
Right. Well, that's great advice. Uh, you probably have done that with your students, I'm sure, in the past. And, and while well, we're doing it now, too, we're doing it now. in a different kind of a way. Um, you know, the, the talk a bit about these lists. You know, there's a Texas list, and I guess all states have lists. And when I look at the music of some of these lists, it's just, I find it, I'm sorry to say, appalling. It is. Um, because the commercial market has gotten in there, gotten their hands around these composers that are particularly adept at writing this music. Look, I have a very good friend, his name is Jared Spears. Right. We went to college together. And he's an old, old friend, he's older than I. But you know the kind of music that he's, he, he writes. He writes very accessible music for grade school through high school. And uh, we've argued about this continually. And when I say, look, uh, as, as much as I admire your work and some of your uh, more advanced pieces are really kind of extraordinary, how can you do this? <laughs> how can you write this music? I mean, he would write two or three pieces on a weekend and then get them published immediately by a whole variety of publishers. And I just don't understand um, what motivates anyone to do that, quite frankly. Yeah. I, don't, I think you sell the, the musicians short and you limit you limit their potential in terms of who they can be as musicians by right. playing really kind of subpar music, it seems to me. Right. Well, now maybe it's changed. I'm so far out of it now, you know, in my life, uh, hadn't thought about that world, but uh, I certainly came up in that world as a young musician. I'd like to tell you that it's changed, but I wouldn't be telling you the truth. Well, <laughs> well, well let me tell you, one thing has changed. And that is the CBDNA's efforts to commission right. young composers and important composers like John Harbison. I mean, the name, you know, the list goes on and on to write pieces for the wind ensemble to enrich the repertoire. No question. It's one of the reasons I decided to continue writing for the ensemble because there were so many good groups like your group, uh, your, your group in Washington and, and Jerry Junkin at the, in, in, in Austin and uh, you know, people all over the country who uh, really can engage uh, music at a very high level. Yeah, um, well, thank you. So we have a lot to the CBA to thank for. In fact, I was involved in a lot of discussions, you know, 25, 30 years ago about whether this was a possibility and how was the CBA DNA gonna, uh, going to compete with the Chicago symphonies of the world. Right. And uh, the way you do that is very simple. I have a kind of consortium that allows you to pool your resources together to fund, uh, you know, composers who otherwise would rather write a piece for the Boston Symphony. Right, we've done a lot of that. Um, yeah. Well, great. Well, okay, students, this is your chance. Those of okay. you who are here. Um, who's moderating? Chris, are you moderating? Who's one of my doc students is moderating? Chris. Uh, yeah, hi, Chris. Hi. 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 Hi, I'm Mr. Schwander. I'm Chris, uh, one of the grad students. Uh, Professor, yeah. we, we do have a question. Sure. Um, I'm gonna call on uh, Rachel Reyes. She's a flute player to ask this question. Okay, Rachel. Hello. Hello. Oh, hi, Rachel. Hi. Yeah, so I'm one of the flute majors here, and I just had a general question about um, your composition. A little, a little louder, please. Oh, sorry. Louder? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I just had a general question about um, your compositions, because yeah. uh, being a flute player, I know that you write a ton for flute. Is there, like, a specific reason you have so much repertoire for flute? Is it, because I know you mentioned that you have a, a big interest in barres. Yeah, I, I always, first of all, I always loved the flute, and look how much flute writing there is in Anne the Mountains Rising Nowhere, 1977. Um, no, I've always I've been very fond of the instrument, have written a lot of pieces uh, for the flute, and it's because I've always had the great good fortune of working with terrific players all my life, you know, like Ransom Wilson, who teaches at Yale, one where I was on, on the faculty, kind of extraordinary player, I wrote a piece for him. And um, most recently, uh, a flutist named uh, Jenny O. Brown, who has a wonderful recording of some of my flute music. Um, and so I've just had really good luck with, with flute players. And you know, any composer is gonna respond to really, really, really good playing uh, in the most uh, hopefully generous way by writing music f for the instrument. And it's an instrument with such capability, don't you think? I mean, I mean, it's so such a facile instrument. You can play so quickly. It has such great expression to it. It has this incredibly sultry sound in this low register. I mean, it has all those things that you would hope an instrument would have in terms of its expressive potential. And I've never seen the limit of it. So it always draws me back every time uh, a project comes up that involves the flute. Thank you. Okay. I'm a really big fan Bye. of Black Anemones. It's one of my favorite pieces ever. Oh, really? Black anemones. 
Yeah, well, that's actually a piece for voice and piano that was transcri which is transcribed for flute. And now it's been played for oboe, and also bassoonist has played it. So lots of people can play it, you know. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. All right. If anyone else has any questions, uh, uh, please uh, let me know, or you can go ahead and ask it at this time. No one else sure. has submitted anything. This is your chance, guys. He won't bite. <laughs> he won't bite. <laughs> Anybody? No more questions. Okay. Well, Joe, I can't thank you enough. Um, oh, delighted. Good to see you. It's good to see you. I hope you get through all of this. Uh, do you know how you're going to proceed in the fall? Not yet. We don't. Uh, We're still waiting to hear. So what's happening out there? Well, I live in Keene, New Hampshire, which is a small uh, New England town, a uh, small college town, and it has a small public college called Keene State College. And they are planning to come back wow. and bring students, students back. And uh, we haven't been... Um, we don't have the kind of, again, crisis like you have in New York and, and, and Boston and Massachusetts. So I think um, the, the level of COVID is quite low in this state. Mm -hmm. It's largely a rural state with only a million and a half people. Right. Um, and so it looks like we're opening up more quickly than uh, maybe, uh, probably not quicker than Montana, but certainly quicker than uh, some of the other states. And we hope that uh, they can continue to open in a very safe way. And we hope the same for you in Washington. Yeah, well, you know the state and it's largely rural except for here. Yeah. And so a number of the counties like Spokane just uh, went to what they're calling phase two. Really? And, um, and that's a fairly sizable town, 250,000 people. That's right. And um, yeah. so we, we have some hope that way. And I think all of the universities, of course, which are giant businesses need to open. Um, the medical center here has already lost five hundred million dollars. The really housing and food services has lost a hundred million. It's it's wow. quite something. Wow. So um, they need to open for business's sake, but of course we want to keep all the students safe. That's the thing. Well, I mean, you could always do, uh, I guess, virtual teaching, but what about the ensembles? How do you deal with that? You well, that's that's where we are. We we're trying our best to think of things that will deepen them in other ways, but nothing replaces live music in the same space, you know. Um yeah, yeah. Yeah yeah. So um well I wish you uh, I wish you well my friend and all your students good luck with your work and let's hope this uh crisis uh we all emerge from it stronger and, and healthier and uh you'll have a bright future in music. And again, uh, from the way I see it, um, you know, music is the way I lead my life, and I'm sure you feel the same way. So good yeah. luck. Best wishes.